Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel for this next episode of Ships of War, the series in which I look at historic warships, the uh, famous, the not so famous, and in some cases the downright notorious, and uh, I try to situate them in their historical context, but also look at the way that they have been treated in a particular game system and try to assess whether that treatment of them is uh, particularly fair. Um, and having recently uh, looked at the game's Central Pacific campaign, I decided that I would pick out um, two of my favourite aircraft carriers from the Second World War and see how they line up next to each other in this game system. Now, as you can see before you, I have the ship counters for the Japanese aircraft carrier Taiho and her... I suppose, counterpart, really, the US aircraft carrier Essex. So to my mind, these two make really, really good uh, comparisons because historically, their stories parallel each other to a, to a very um, interesting degree. Um, so a bit of background, I suppose. Um, both of them were effectively wartime builds, um, the U.S. carrier had had its development really in the um, the Vincent Trammell Acts and the Two Ocean Navy Acts of, of the end of the 30s and 1940. 1940 really is when these acts come into force. And they were a response to the developing situation in Europe. And the aim for the United States was the creation of a two ocean navy that would be so overwhelmingly powerful, it would re it would render the rest of the world's navies effectively irrelevant. So basically being a guarantee of U US security, however the war um, turned out. It was a very sensible move, uh, and it, it began the process of creating a fleet that was quite frankly scary. Um, and of course, the, the end result of that is that Essex and ultimately... 23 other sister ships um, are completed by the 1950s. Now, that that does sound a scary number on its own when we're talking about aircraft carriers, but when I get more into the specifics of what Essex and her sisters were like, it gets even scarier. Um, the Japanese ship was the result of more a steady process um, and working within existing Japanese naval expansion plans. Now, the, the Japanese had a bit of a problem in that when the Two Ocean Navy Act went public in the United States, the, the problem it presented the Japanese with was that if the Americans could pull off a fleet expansion of this magnitude, it would completely trash any Japanese plans for keeping, for even attempting to keep pace with the strength of the US Navy. They simply did not have the industrial capacity to do that. Um, and it speaks volumes that Taiho was a, a one-off. Originally, the Japanese had wanted to build perhaps five or six of this class, but at the end of the day, they could only produce one. Um, so what about design origins? Because there's some interesting parallels there. So when the United States enters the Second World War, their most modern aircraft carriers are the three ships of the Yorktown class, which had entered service um, in, the, in the very late 1930s. So, you know, the familiar names Yorktown, Enterprise and Hornet. Um, so the Essex class built on the strength of that very good design and effectively just made it bigger and even better. And uh, um, uh, to be honest, there wasn't really much else they could do. The, the, the Yorktown was a brilliant template for taking the design forward. And on the Japanese side, when they finally throw their hat into the ring of the conflict with the attack on Pearl Harbor, their newest aircraft carriers are the two ships of the Shokaku class, Shokaku and Zuikaku. Both of those enter service uh, in the spring of 1941. So they're really, really new. Uh, and they are effectively Japan's newest and most modern characters at the time. So, uh, sorry, characters, carriers at the time. So it's perhaps easiest to think of Taiho, um, much as Essex was with the Yorktowns, as really a much improved offshoot of the um, Shokaku class and, and a really fine carrier in her own right. 
So what about the histories of the two ships? I, I will get into um, Shoka, uh, Shokaku, sorry, getting my carriers mixed up. I will get into Taiho first, because sadly she has the shorter history of the two. Now, if I get this picture out here, um, there are not many photographs of Taiho, unfortunately, because she had such a short life. Um, but looking at this profile, people who like their carriers would probably be forgiven for thinking that they were looking at an Allied aircraft carrier, particularly a British one. There's a good reason for that, because she has what the British called the, the hurricane bow design where the bow rises up to meet the flight deck. And that was a feature of a lot of British carriers, and particularly the newer generations, you know, indomitable, indefatigable, uh, which, which entered service in the mid to late war period. Um, and even the um, entry for this ship, um, published by the office, the US Office of Naval Intelligence, does say that, you know, this, this ship from a distance could be mistaken for the new British CVs or aircraft carriers. The um, distinctive island was an improvement of the type that equipped Shokaku and Zuikaku. It was a bit more capacious. It had more room for an admiral and staff, um, a bit more room for what we would call command and control facilities. Uh, unlike older Japanese carriers, the the funnel, in keeping with the um, shokaku pattern, was on the island, but it was angled outboard much in the same way as uh, the converted Japanese carrier um, Junyo, the former merchant vessel that had been turned into a carrier. So you've got a very Western-looking carrier, which is quite interesting. Now, this is not a great photo because I appreciate it's really dark and you can't make out many of her features. But if I flip it over, we have this slightly better one here. I'll just back the camera out a tiny bit. There we are. So you can see more details of the flight deck now. And you can see there's the usual pattern. Um, the very distinctive Japanese communications masts, which could be trunked down to, uh, sorry, no, um, uh, they, they were hinged so that they could be lowered during flight operations. And you get a sense of the scale of the ship from the aircraft she has parked uh, astern there. So essentially, in some ways, she follows Japanese um, carrier design. Yes, she does look a bit Western, but when you look behind that very interesting bow, which doesn't really, it, it never features on any other Japanese carrier during the war. It makes Taiho very unique. Um, but she is inherently a Japanese design. Um, so all the lessons of the Shokaku class are carried over. But what makes her a bit different is the fact that the Japanese, in the very, very last days where they had any kind of access to information on the Royal Navy and its experience of the war, um, they paid a lot of attention to the um, sufferings of the poor British carrier Illustrious, uh, illustrious rather, uh, which had taken an absolute beating in the Mediterranean in 1941. And what impressed the Japanese most was her staying power. That ship, over a course of weeks, ate the equivalent of enough bombs to sink any carrier in the Japanese inventory. But she was neither crippled nor, nor destroyed outright. So what impressed the Japanese observers most was the efficacy of her armoured deck. And so for the first time in the Imperial Navy a carrier was built with an armoured flight deck. Now, this, this was quite an important step for the Japanese because they'd never, they'd never incorporated anything other than side armour in their aircraft carriers before. And even the mighty Akagi and Kaga, which had been converted from uh, battleships, uh, a battleship and a battle cruiser, um, they had strength decks, yes, but these were the original battleship decks, so they only really protected the machinery spaces. The air handling side of it uh, and the flight deck side of it were completely unprotected. So that's a nice visual of Taiho. Now, compared to her, we have so many photographs of so many of the US uh, Essex class carriers that it's actually really quite hard to, to pick one. Um, this is one of my favourites. This is USS Essex herself, fairly late in her career. Um, 
I love the photo because there's so much going on. For one, taken at sea level, it conveys her enormous size, and I'm going to go into a comparison between the two ships in a bit. Um, you've also got some of her really lovely. I think this is 1944 era camouflage, and you've got that incredibly busy flight deck. Now keep that in mind. Because there's a lot to be said about the U.S. Navy's plane handling capabilities and aerial operations capabilities in the late war period,、um, and when you look at all those aircraft crowded on the flight deck and think about the sheer organization required, not only to arrange that in the first place, if you're doing an air transport mission, or if you're in a relatively quiet area where you can afford to have everyone stacked up like that.、Um, But you know, not just the ability to do that, but the also the ability to disentangle it when you need to,、uh, and it also gives an impression of the sheer size of the flight deck on these things. The if it wasn't clear before from my my enthusiastic ravings, it should be clear now that these were big ships with a lot of air handling space. And you also get glimpses here and there of some of the ship's armament.、Um, So you get the, I mean, those are the independent five-inch guns. Unfortunately, we can't really see her turreted ones from here, but you can see one of the quadruple forty millimeters up there, and another quad over over here at the bow. I'll just move that up.、Um, so yeah, there is a lot going on in this picture, and also deck edge elevator. Another very important innovation, which was introduced in the U.S. Navy in this class, you get. Oh wait, no, sorry. There's the deck edge elevator. What am I talking about?、Um, so yes, a lot of new features appear in the Essex class, which set a new standard in aircraft carrier design and construction.、Um, apologies for Oscar. I think he's just agreeing with me because he loves the Essex class as well. So moving on from the photos. Right, ah, mind out, cat. So, how did these two ships compare to each other in action? Well, that's actually a very easy question to answer. I'm going to go back to、um, Taiho for a moment, and I'll just accompany the photograph with this nice little profile picture of her. Just so you can get a slightly better sense of what she looks like from the other side. So yes, as I alluded to earlier, Taiho had an extremely short career of service with the Imperial Navy. Her construction proceeded fairly slowly because of the demands placed upon the Japanese shipbuilding industry by by the war. They had to not only serve the needs of the Imperial Navy, but they fell behind trying to keep up with the requirements of the Merchant Marine as well. And so it meant that Taiho did not actually enter service until March 1944.、And、this was particularly important because by that point, although nobody could really appreciate it at the time, the the Japanese naval Um, air strength, particularly their carrier-based air strength, was in a sort of slow terminal decline. They had plenty of aircraft, but the aircraft models were dated, and the quality of their pilots、uh, was not not the best. Let's say, and that was mainly because of the nature of the Japanese Navy's training programs. Even late in the war, un until circumstances forced a change, they were still churning out pilots.、Um, The, who, who were set? Who, who were set very exacting standards, and so they never had more than a trickle of replacements until it was far too late. So they were beginning to reverse this policy in 1944. But by the time Taiho commissioned with her first air wing, many of her pilots were inexperienced. So her first major action, and also her last, was the attempt to relieve the Marianas Islands in late June 1944. The Japanese sent the best of their reconstituted carrier fleets,、um, which will mind the tail,、um, which really only consisted of three fleet aircraft carriers, including Taiho, of which she was the most capable by design,、uh, and about seven escort carriers, or at least Japanese equivalent of escort or light carriers. 
Um, the, the, the course of the battle is quite well known, so I'm not going to linger over it overall, but just to say it went really badly for the Japanese. They lost the vast majority of the aircraft they committed, um, and they lost two of the three fleet carriers that they committed to this battle. Now, Taiho was lost in very tragic circumstances. She was hit by a single torpedo which her protective system actually dealt with quite well in terms of flooding. She pretty much shrugged it off, but it did damage her, her aviation fuel um, pumping and distribution system, and it caused a significant leak. Now, the problem with this was that Japanese damage control, um, combined to the fact that her crew were basically uh, newbies, uh, meant meant that the, the problem was not handled as well as it should have been. Um, aviation gas fumes got into the ship's ventilation system, and rather than clearing them, a mistake on the part of the damage control officer actually led to the whole ship's ventilation system being saturated with these fumes. So all it took was a spark from a generator in the hangar deck to trigger a series of explosions which effectively doomed the ship. A very, very tragic way for such a fine carrier to go. Um, and oddly reminiscent of what happened to USS Yorktown um, at the Battle of the Coral Sea in May 1942. So that was the very short life of HIJMS Taiho. What about the Essex? Now, she, I'm glad to say, has a much happier life. Let me just adjust the phone to get us on a decent decent level for this picture. So here we go. I'm going to bring Essex back and um, I'm going to include this so that you can get a better sense of what she looks like. Now, um, just to point out, because I've shamelessly nicked these images from Conway's All the World's Fighting Ships, um, there's that important note there about this being USS Randolph, one of the later carriers, and that she's got the uh, long bow type. So the long bow was introduced uh, in order to improve sea keeping mainly, but it also gave a better field of fire for the forward gun. You see on, um, on Essex, it's very slightly overshadowed by the flight deck, which doesn't impede your firing, but it does impede your vision, which is just as important. So USS Essex and her sisters uh, also fought at the, um, the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot, or the Battle of the Philippine Sea, as it's more properly known. Um, and they did superbly. Um, their air wings um, comprised modern, powerful aircraft. They had the measure of their Japanese opponents. The U.S. pilots were extremely well trained. Um, no Japanese aircraft actually got anywhere near any of the carriers, or if they did, they didn't live very long. Um, and the only capital ship to be damaged on the U.S. side was actually one of their battleships. So, um, so the Essex was tested in combat, but not seriously. Um, and it's it's good that both carriers were there because as a, a comparison, maybe an unfair comparison of their relative performance, um, it, it was a good uh, demonstration of how the two types operated in combat. Although, again, as I say, between the quality of the air wings and the levels of training of their crews, not really a fair fight. There was also the awkward fact that the Japanese were badly outnumbered. There were seven U.S. fleet carriers present at the Battle of the Philippine Sea. And of those seven, five were Essex uh, and her sisters. So a very, very formidable concentration of firepower. Now, these carriers were a really good investment for the U.S. Navy because not only were they incredibly capable ships by the standards of the Second World War, but they were large enough to accommodate a lot of future proofing. And you see many of them having um, careers that stretch well into the Cold War. A number of them were substantially rebuilt in the 50s and 60s in order to suit them for jet aircraft. Um, and Essex herself had many, many adventures until the mid 1970s when she was finally. Yes, I know, Oscar. Sorry, everyone. Pardon the cat. He's getting a bit getting a bit impatient with me, and I think he prefers Taiho. Um, so anyway, yes, the um, Essex herself lasted until about 1975, 
which is a truly, truly impressive uh, record. Um, I think no other nation's carriers, except possibly the British, linger that long. Um, although, actually, to be fair, uh, by the end of the Second World War, it was really only the British and the US that had meaningful aircraft carrier forces. Um, but the British carriers that last into the Cold War era, you're really just looking at victorious in terms of one that had a very long life post-war. Uh, for the US, the vast majority of the Essexes did amazing service um, for decades after the end of World War II. And uh, although they were quite manpower intensive, they were, um, they were very good ships and they clearly were worth the money spent on them. So that's it for the ship histories. I think what I'm going to do, because there's quite a bit to say, is I am going to come back in another video to assess how they've been treated by um, the game system in Central Pacific campaign. So I'll do that as a separate video, um, just to keep this one a bit sensibly um, short. But I do hope you found this interesting, and I hope that we're off to a good start uh, in terms of this particular episode. Um, as always, thank you very much for following the Ships of War series. To all of you who, who've been watching it, who enjoy it, who leave comments, I'm very, very grateful to you for the input. Um, to all my long-suffering regulars, a very, very big hello to all of you. Um, I hope you're keeping well, and it's always good to see you guys, as ever. Um, if you're new to my videos, if this is the first of my videos you've ever watched, then you're very, very welcome to the channel. Um, please do have a wander around. If there's anything else you like, then you're more than welcome to have a look at it. Um, and please do leave comments. I'd love to know what you think, suggestions and so forth. If it's the Central Pacific campaign game or either of these two fascinating ships that brought you here, then I would really... Um, uh, I would really encourage you to look at the other videos I've done for Central Pacific Campaign. If it's wargaming in general, then as I say, please have a look. Um, I hope you find other stuff that you like on the channel. Um, but as always, whoever you are and wherever you're watching from, do take care. And I really look forward to seeing you in part two. Bye.